The Lord be with you. Well, good morning, everyone. Today is the last day to sign up for the October 6th um, charitable giving event because it's catered. They need to know how many are coming. I talked with one person who worked with that man who's coming in, and she said, I didn't think that we had enough money to worry about and that our kids were too small to worry about it, but she said it was very helpful. So, you know, you might want to think about going. October 20th is a special voters meeting, and it's a milestone in the life of our church because it's the reunification of Good Shepherd and Redeemer. So you might want to make plans right after church on October 20th to stay around for that voters meeting. Something wonderful goes on in our church that is that we're partnering in world ministry with Project Video, and they reach people groups that don't even have a written language or many people who know how to read. Some of the people involved in that ministry are going to be here Friday night or Friday afternoon. It's 4.30. Is it afternoon? I suppose afternoon. If you're free, come in here. It's exciting stuff they're doing. We'll be right in the social hall Friday at 4.30 in the afternoon. And finally, you probably thought we came up with a creative way to deal with the, the fabric on the chairs that are wearing out. But no, that's not what's going on today. Instead, Janice Jensen is going to tell you what these quilts are all about. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I hope you'll take a few minutes when you're done here to look at the quilts that are made and this is just a small amount of the 300 that we have made this year. Um, some of them, the baptism quilts and full-size quilts, and some of them are the um, cuddle quilts. That's something that we've enlarged upon because we have an outlet for those. Um, this is the time of year that we start quilting. It's the middle of September, and we start usually at um, the middle of September, and we go until Thanksgiving, and then on uh, we start in January, right after the first of the year, and we go until Easter. Um, and so there's only about six months that we do a quilt, but we have um, people sewing in their homes um, besides us that are at the church. And we meet on Wednesdays from 12.30 to 2.30. And then at 2.30 we have coffee and a little chatting and goodies and fun, so and laughter. So it, it's a fun time. Um, and then... <clears throat> well, we do have people sewing at home, making the tops before we come to church. So we assemble them that day. We put the tops, middles, and backs together. And then we take So if anyone that can tie a knot, you're welcome to come. Or we can find something for you to do, too. So... Um, we also have Geraldine Staska, who does so much uh, sewing at her home. She has people, a few volunteers that come in from church that help her, and some that help her buy fabric. And um, it's really a wonderful thing because she likes to stay busy. She likes to give back, and she uh, is housebound now. And so it's nice that people come in and visit with her. I would like to do some thank yous. We have. Um, a lot of people who have been very generous to our group. We are um, not in the church budget, so we live uh, go by what people give us. Uh, in the social room, there is a table in the back with the round, uh, there is a table in the social room with uh, where people put fabric if they don't want it, if they put old sheets that they don't want, thread, anything that pertains to sewing, and it goes in that round table in the back, and then I put it away where it belongs. Um, and we really depend on things like that. We have people that go to garage sales and we, with the purpose of buying sheets and things for the quilters, and we appreciate that. We, so we thank you for that. And they spend their own money most of the time, too, so that's, that's wonderful unless they buy a whole bunch. But anyway, uh, and then we have the two meals, the Advent and the Lenten meals, and you are more than generous with your donations to that, and we really appreciate that. And last but not least, we have those who have been giving grants, and we couldn't exist without the grants because we're very fortunate. All of those quilts have had new backs on them, um, not just any used fabric, and most of our fronts are all new fabric also. So we have been very blessed. Um, tomorrow we will be dispersing them, or at least bagging them up to be dispersed because some of them are 
be going out of town. Um, at 1.30 tomorrow, so if uh, any of you quilters weren't at the meeting last Wednesday, uh, we have about 25 quilters, and of course there's probably about 16 that come on a, um, throughout the day, um, because some people can't come some weeks and some can come other weeks. Um, so tomorrow we'll be bagging them up and places that they're going to go. Oh, I forgot, I think, did I mention Jerry makes all the baptism quilts? Here's a baptism quilt. And these are for the boys, and they have the cross on it, and they're nice and soft. Mm -hmm. They have Minky on the back, so they're wonderful. <laughs> and so she's busy with that. So I need my list. Okay, so the places that the quilts are going to be distributed, the majority of them stay in Steele County. Um, we have, you'll see the ones that don't. We give to beds for kids. We've already given to our graduates this spring when they graduated. We take to the hospitality house, Rachel's Light, Rochester Warehouse. They send things to Haiti. Ronald McDonald House in Rochester, Salvation Army, Pathways, Transitional Housing, and Lurthan World Relief. And those are the places that we'll be sending them to. And in case you're interested, Salvation Army store is closed, but they do have a presence here in Owatonna. And so they are still going to be taking quilts because they will be preparing for disaster and for people who have fires and a, a great need. So if anyone's interested in joining us, come. Um, information is in the bulletin. And if you have any questions, I'll be around out there afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. <laughs> Please rise as we start our service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the hands that pitch in and do work to bless other people. It reflects your nature. You've blessed us so mightily. We just have to look around and think. Praise your holy name this morning. Amen.
The first reading is Daniel 10, verses 10 through 14, and 12, verses 1 to 3. An angel is sent by God to explain a vision to the prophet Daniel, but is delayed on his mission by a demon. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you, and stand up, for I, am, for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning. People, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Here ends the reading. The second reading is from Revelation 12, verses 7 through 12. There is a war of rebellion in heaven with the result that Satan and his followers are cast down to earth. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of the Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice you, heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. Here ends the reading. If you are able, you are invited to stand out of respect for the gospel. The gospel reading is Matthew 18, verses 1 through 11. Little children are so important to God that he assigns them guardian angels. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Here ends the reading.
One of the great things about going camping or heading north is that when you get away from the city lights, the stars seem so much brighter. I've heard, I've never tried it out, but I've heard that if you have access to a chimney and in the middle of the day can look up through that chimney through the top, you can see the stars even in the middle of the day. So if you're not afraid of getting soot in your hair, try it out and let me know if that really works. <laughs> what I do know is that our first reading said, those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. In a world where there are so many things that tug on us for our time and our attention, there are some things that have a lasting importance, like forever and ever. And those things ought to be on our hearts and minds as we decide what we give our life to. And that's the theme for our confession today. Let's confess in the words on the screen. Lord God, our Father, you have given to each of us the same number of hours in a day and days in a year. Help me to set my heart and mind on what is valuable and eternal. I confess I ignore the moments when I can encourage faith in others by teaching a child or encouraging a friend or visiting a relative or praying with someone who is hurting. Lord God, use my life for what is really important. Use me to lead others to your forgiveness and salvation. Help me to be an example of someone who lives your righteous way better than I do today. Amen. It says in the Bible that in heaven they don't need the sun or the moon because the brightness of God is all the light they need. It's like we will live in the reflected light of God's righteousness. And even today, the righteousness of God touches your life. The most important way is when Jesus died on the cross for all of your sins. He took that away. And then his righteousness floods into you and covers you. Because of what he did that day, I announce to you the forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing in praise to our God.
That is kind of the focus for today. So two verses on is perfect. It gets us into the right place, all right? Um, it is um, a special Sunday in the church year, one that like, very rarely do we actually celebrate, because normally it doesn't follow, uh, fall on a Sunday, but it's a, um, a Sunday that happens to coordinate with St. about that a little bit, but but we're going to get there, okay? So we're going to get there, but I did want to give you guys a little preview of why we're going kind of far off field to get there. Um, I was thinking um, about the unseen realms and, and where we start to study it, where we look at it, where we get fascinated with the spiritual or, or the mysterious or those kinds of things in the world. And, and I was thinking, man, I've had a little bit of touch with it lately and some of the different media that I've taken. And you see, my wife and I, uh, the close of the evening, we have um, different you know, traditions or whatever I, I know as we kind of close off the night. We're always going and saying goodnight to our kids. And then after we say goodnight to the kids, um, Jess and I generally kind of turn on TV and watch some kind of streaming service for a little while until she's like, okay, Dan, I'm, I'm almost asleep. Now you watch something else while I finish falling asleep, okay? Um, because that allows her to get all the way asleep before I start doing what? Snoring, right? Okay? And so she's like, okay, I got to get to sleep. Um, and so I always try to find something that I can watch that like is some like a boring droning documentary because then she can fall asleep peacefully and I'm still kind of being lulled to the place where I can then go to sleep and I'm not like too into something. So I went through all the nature documentaries on Netflix, like watch one after the next, after the next, after the next. Um, and after I got kind of tired of those, I'm jumping along trying to find other documentaries that are, are just interesting enough that I can stay awake for a little bit. But again, I'm getting ready for bed. I ran across something a couple weeks ago, and it was just something kind of random, all right, that I was like, huh, well, I'll watch this because I'll watch just about anything. And it was about different people and alien encounters that they thought that they had had, all right? I'm like, eh, again, I'll try just about anything for a little while. And so I started listening to these people, and what kind of fascinated me uh, about this one of these people talking about these perceived alien encounters was it talked not only about what they perceived that they had seen or experienced, but they were also talking about the very real impact in their regular lives. Because of the things that, that they had experienced, there was division amongst groups of people where some people were like, oh, I saw this, and other people were like, no, you did not. There was a, um, a church school over in Africa where a bunch of kids th thought that they had had some of this crazy experience. And the school was being ripped apart and its mission and ministry was struggling because of all this stuff. There was even a husband and wife who ended up, uh, the wife left the husband and they got a divorce because of this perceived experience. And I was sitting there and I was thinking about this and it's like, okay, whatever was going on or wasn't going on, it's this kind of realm of mystery in our world and there's a realm of mystery that seems to attack us. It's the unseen breaking into the scene. And there's, again, there's a lot of things that we don't know, but the Bible is clear that there is an unseen spiritual realm, and part of the unseen spiritual realm is evil. You only have to go to Genesis chapter what? Genesis chapter 3, and you have Satan sitting there and coming in and saying, oh, I am here to attack. And it is the unseen breaking into the scene, sitting there and bringing temptation to Eve. And again, the Bible doesn't sit there and delve into this world in, in, in a lot of great depth, and so there's a lot of mystery around it, but it gives us these little peeks into it, these little clues. It, it helps us perceive just enough to kind of be aware and maybe to be on our guard. Like Daniel 10 and 12 that we heard read just a little bit ago, and you're like, what is this about? It's so strange, it's so mysterious. Like even the name given for the demon, the Prince of Persia, like what is the Prince of Persia? Well, I can tell you all the commentators like to argue with each other about it and they don't know for sure. But there are some things that they kind of think they've figured out over time as they've studied this text. The Prince of Persia seems to imply, okay, the term prince means, well, I guess he's some kind of higher up demon. Now, whether it's the, the devil or Satan himself, or whether it's some kind of um, a fallen archangel below him, we don't know, but he has some real power. And the idea that he's the Prince of Persia, 
Well, remember when Daniel's writing, Persia is kind of the, the, the chief territory in the world. It is the, the biggest movers, the biggest shakers, the biggest political military might is settled in that place. And in God's people's greatest hope was for the Persians to spare them, the Persians to lift them up, the Persians to send them out exile, exile the Persians to support them. And so it's like the devil and his minions are like, hey, if we can attack them through Persia, man, we're going to have some real power and we can stop God's people and his message. You jump into Revelation and, and a little bit more is told of what's going on kind of behind the scenes so often. It says, War arose in heaven, and Michael and his angels were fighting against the dragon. The dragon Satan, right? And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven, and the great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent who was called the devil, Satan, the deceiver of the world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels thrown down with him. You heard the, the terms for Satan, right? It talks about Satan, uh, the word Satan itself, uh, based on a Hebrew word that, that means the accuser, and then it calls him the deceiver. And both names are really accurate names for what the devil wants to do. He wants to accuse and he wants to deceive. You know, there's the old cultural image that we have of the little devil on our shoulder whispering into our ear, and it's kind of a, an accurate one, right? Because that is kind of the way the devil likes to work. He likes to take things and twist them and put them into our ear and to tempt us. And, and the temptations can be many. The temptations can be plethora. You know the ones that he likes to speak into your ear. So often it seems like he's just trying to say anything that can get us to break things down in this world. Maybe I can and put something in your ear, the devil says, that's going to make you hurt other people. Some kind of unkind word that you can say about someone. Maybe some piece of gossip that you are just going to pass on. Sometime when he's like, if you, I can just get you to put an unkind construction on someone else and then to tell someone else who's then going to tell someone else who's then going to tell someone else, oh my goodness, then he is just having his way, isn't he? I mean, how often does that thought go through our heads? Just some unkindness, some hurtful, some painful thing about someone else, whether it's true or half true or untrue. And we pass it on rather than building someone up, we're tearing someone down. The devil's got all kinds of tricks up his sleeve. It's really interesting in Daniel. It sits there in, in the beginning of the chapter, in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel was, was praying to God, was appealing to God for help, for clarity, for message. And it says that, that God sends a messenger to Daniel, right? And then what does this prince of Persia do? He gets in the way, like he's bold enough to apparently to attack um, this, this angelic messenger that's on his way to, to David, or to Daniel, excuse me. And even if he can't stop him, the angel, uh, this, this attacker, this prince of Persia says, well, maybe I can just delay the messenger. And I thought, Oh, how true is that? How often would Satan just like to delay God's word getting to us? To delay God's answer getting to us? How many times have you been in one of those places where you pray to God and it seems like his answer is what? Delayed. Every single one of us has been in one of those places, right? You're sitting there and you're praying to God. You're appealing to him. God, I need your help with this that's going on in life. Or there's this person in my life, this, this family member who's sick and in need of healing. Or there's this thing going on that, that I'm not sure what the answer is to. God, give me wisdom. Give me insight. And we're praying. And we want God's answer. And we need God's answer quick. And it seems like God is what? Slow. Like his answer is Delayed. Who knows what's going on? But it seems like sometimes maybe that's Satan's method. I will just delay things a little bit. Or maybe I, I will accuse God in the ears of a Christian mom. She's like, no, 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 no. You will not be involved in that. I was like, what is it? I don't even know what it means. Right? But God, or excuse me, Satan would love to get people just fascinated with that which is dark. That which is a little evil. And so he does it in many and various ways. We can come into the seasons, we come in up into October, right? And Halloween can be fun, and Halloween can be full of a lot of great joys, right? Like, like kids dressed up, going around and asking neighbors for candy. That's what? That's fun. 
But Satan loves to twist things sometimes and say, okay, can I get people to just delve into the darkness, right? You sit there and even the, the, the strange thing that I mes- mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, the people that, that became so fascinated with aliens, right? How like Satan is that? I don't know what those people saw or what they did not see. There is no way to verify it. But Satan loves to deceive. And he loves to dress up. In Genesis chapter 3, what's he do? Dresses up like a snake so he can deceive Eve. Later on in the Old Testament, you, you see him appear to Saul like a, like a ghost of, of a prophet so that he can deceive Saul and cause him to despair. You see, Satan loves to dress up in all kinds of different ways. And if it can turn people from God and get people to be afraid or scared or deceived, man, that's the kind of thing that he likes to do. Anything that can get people to focus away from God and towards him. That mysterious realm can seem kind of scary, can't it? It can seem intimidating. And there's a lot that we don't know. But the question on today, on this Sunday where we celebrate St. Michael and all archangels, is what do we know and what can we trust? And when we hear these stories, what we know and what we can trust is that God has always won and God always wins. You sit there and you delve into these stories, right? And, and it sits there and shows time after time. The prince of Persia might have sat there and attacked that angel for a little while, but then God wins, the message gets through. When you sit there and you go forward, just those couple of chapters to chapter 12, 1 through 3, what does it say? At that time shall arise Michael and the great prince who was in charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be what? Delivered. And everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake to everlasting life. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sun above and like the stars in the sky. What does this tell us? That God what? God wins. The resurrection is coming. And, and there's a final defeat that is coming for Satan and his minions. And you can go all the way to the end then, right? Go to Revelation chapter 12 and you sit there and you lead, read the vision there. There was a war in heaven and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. But they were what? Defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down. He and his angels were what? Thrown down. Do you get the idea? What happened to them? They were what? Thrown down. How many times can the Bible say it? Yeah, there is power out there, but the power of Jesus is bigger, it is better, it is stronger. And as he applies, says that the saints have conquered how by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony i love that verse we've conquered by the blood of the lamb and the testimony of jesus christ you see the satan or the dragon he might might look scary he might seem that the lamb I love that image when I came across it this week. It's on this new um, uh, software that, that we've started to purchase and get licensed. Look at it. It's like, there's the serpent. And there, what is stomping on it? A lamb's hoof. I just loved it. I was like, there you go. The lamb is more powerful than the dragon, right? That's cool. God applies that to us. And when we sit there and we think about ourselves washed in the blood of the Lamb, we've got the answer to every single dark, tempting accusation that Satan throws out at us. When he's sitting there and tempting and saying, hey, don't you want to say we, you know, this, or don't you want to spread this, or, or oh, this is truthful, you better go tell someone this story about someone else, then you can say, no, 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 I've got the blood of the Lamb on me. I don't need to give in to that temptation, Satan. No matter what you're speaking into my ear, I don't want to say those things. I want to say that which is good, that which is pure, that which is true. 
And when Satan sits there and he's on your shoulder and he gets you to do something that you shouldn't do or say something that you shouldn't do and all of a sudden the accusation comes against you and you're like, oh my, I am, I'm a terrible, horrible person. I can't believe I failed again. Then what do you say to Satan? Uh Uh-uh, not listening to your accusation because I have been washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. And so whatever you say about me is no longer true because I've got Jesus. And when you're sitting there in one of those desert places and you're feeling kind of spiritually dry or tired out and you've been waiting and waiting and waiting on God's answer, what can you say? I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And so no matter what's going on in life or what's not happening in life, I know the thing that is truest about me right now is that I have that which I need most. God's grace his love, and his forgiveness. And it means that no matter what happens in this life, I know what's happening in the next. And so God won, God wins. And when I trust in Jesus, I win too. It's cool, we know what the future is going to be. And it's so beautiful and powerful that God says, I'm with you in this world too. Like I said, there's a lot about the the kind of dark, mysterious unseen that we don't know. There's even a lot about the light and the good that's going on in this world that we don't know, but that God tells us just enough to know it's for us, right? We're not alone in this world. We are not alone in this world because God is with us and he says, guess what? I sent you angels. And we're like, what are the angels? I don't know. I don't understand the angels very well because the Bible just gives us little peeks and glimpses of them too. But he says that that this archangel Michael is for us and he is awesome. Okay? And when I say that, like awesome, I don't just mean like colloquially, like, oh, that's awesome. I mean like, no, 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 like full of awe and power. God says that Michael, when he sits there and describes him, is just just this awesome force in the world. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came and he helped me. He delivered me. And then you sit there and you look at chapter 12, right? And how he describes Michael, the archangel. Michael, the great prince who is in charge of the people, will sit there and he will cause us to stand. Michael is like standing next to us. The Hebrew word is Ahmad. He is like right there next to us. And then it says that he will deliver us, which is just another Hebrew word um, from Ahmad, saying he will cause us to stand. With the power of the unseen, God is causing us to stand. And it takes down the power of Satan. There's all kinds of angels that are out there. We know that, right? When you sit there and you read scripture, um, that's the beautiful vision over and over and over again, right? Um, Revelation, like I said, gives us that vision of the, the things that are going on. Michael and his angels fought Satan, and the devil and angels fought back, but they were what? Defeated. They were defeated at the beginning, and they are defeated in the world right now. The word for defeated was translated better, actually, in the the NIV that you just heard, which was that the devil and his angels weren't strong enough because God and his angels are stronger. You see that throughout the scriptures. Again, it just peeks out every once in a while. Like you get the story of Elisha when he's sitting there and there's these forces of evil that are arrayed against the kingdom. And then Elisha's like, no, 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 it's okay, everyone. Open your eyes again and look out there. And they're like, oh my goodness, there's these chariots full of angels for us out there. And he says, that which is for us is stronger than that which is against us. Even Jesus on his darkest day is sitting there and saying, what? If I wanted, I could call down legions of angels. He doesn't do it because he's got a plan that's bigger and stronger than anything that the devil could do, but he could have. That which is for us is greater than that which is against us. God won, God wins, and God is going to win again. I think it's kind of fun sometimes to to watch these shows about the mysterious and the unknown. I don't know why. Like I said, maybe it's just You know, it's just kind of an interest in saying, hey, there is some stuff going on out there in the world that's strange and that we will never fully understand. And maybe I just want to be a little bit aware of some of the things that are going on out there in the world. But the truth that I know most is the truth that comes 
from the scripture. And that says that God is for me. And that which he has in the unseen realm is stronger than anything that the devil can do in that realm too. It was interesting in that documentary that I watched that, like I said, there were a bunch of people who, who had real struggles in life because of whatever the attacks were that were going on in their world. But in that documentary, there are a couple of people who also mentioned, and I thought this was interesting that this slipped into a Netflix documentary. I don't know, you know, I, I guess they were just trying to be real about the different things that were going on in people's lives. But there were a couple of them that said, I know I'm okay because I will always trust in God. It's like, wow, that was kind of cool that that slipped there into like a, just a secular documentary. And that's my truth too. That's the truth of the scripture. That no matter what is going on in the world around us, the things that we can see, the things that we cannot see, God won, God wins, and God will always bring the victory. Because the lamb and his angels are more powerful than the serpent and his Amen. Amen. In our prayers this morning, we appeal to God. We, we go directly to him and we say we bring our people to him and, and we'll wait on God's answer because we know God's answer comes in the good and perfect time. And so, we continue to pray for um, the members of this congregation who are sick and going through um, various trials and times uh, where they need a healing hand. We continue to pray for Paul Proft. He's uh, been going through his procedures in Rochester. He's had to deal with some infections, so we pray that he can get through those infections pretty soon. We're praying for Marlis Kekeritz. She had a fall up in the cities when she was visiting family, and she's in a rehab place there recovering as well. Um, certainly prayers for those who've experienced um, the hurricane down in Florida and the southeast. And uh, um, we want to pray over Redeemer too, Redeemer Lutheran, um, that decision that they've made and over our congregation's decision still to be made, uh, that God would guide us, bring us wisdom and unity in that. Let's go to God right now. And praise um, for the, both the seen and the unseen. Lord, there's a lot of stuff that we don't understand, a lot of mystery in this world that you just can't explain to us, I guess, and that's okay. Because you tell us the things that we most need to know, which is that you are victorious in all realms. Everything is under your hand. You are king and ruler over it all. And as powerful as some things are that might oppose us or tempt us or accuse us, you have the perfect answer. And it's that you love us, that you forgive us, and that you are always with us and for us. Help us to remember that, Lord, in our daily lives, uh, whether there are big and dramatic things that happen or just the regular daily temptations. You are with us, you are for us, you love us and forgive us. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd be with those who are in times of trial. And as they suffer, Lord, that you would help them to wait on your answer. We pray that you'd be with Marlis and Carol and Fred and Duel and Paul and Kathy. Lord, that you would grant your healing according to your wisdom um, and that you grant us um, sustenance and peace during our times of waiting. We pray that according to your merciful uh, hand, Lord. We pray that you'd be with those who've been uh, affected by the hurricane this past week in the southeast. Lord, that you um, grant your strength to, to those who are trying to pick up the pieces, that you grant peace to those who may have lost loved ones, who have been hurt, and who have had homes that are damaged, Lord, and that you would uh, grant strength to those who go and, and bring about recovery efforts as well, Lord, um, that you would bring your people together, that they would know that we are stronger than, than any force that can break things down in this world. And Lord, we pray that you'd be with your church. Lord, your, your church is a universal force all around the world. There's one big church, which you place us in, in local context too. And so here in Owatonna, um, you've placed us as Redeemer Lutheran and as Good Shepherd Lutheran. And, and Lord, we thank you for the ministry that's happened uh, um, in both those congregations. And right now, Lord, um, Redeemer has said that it seems like a time for them to, to come back towards Good Shepherd. And we don't know exactly what that means, Lord, but we place this into your hands. We ask that you grant us wisdom as, as the voters of this congregation, as the men and women uh, of your church come together and pray on that and a vote on that in a couple of weeks. We ask, above all, Lord, for a spirit of unity. Um, that we would not be torn apart, but that we would come together so that we can advance the gospel work of your church here in Owatonna and beyond. And Lord, for your servants here, 
Lord, we, we have opportunities to serve you in big and, and little ways every single day. We give thanks to your, for your servants who've put together these quilts that we're um, sitting on right now or that our backs rest at. Lord, that these quilts would go out to the world and to Steele County and that those who receive them would know that they've been prayed over, that they've been blessed, and that it is a sign of your love breaking into this world. It is something seen that represents the unseen love of God. Lord, these prayers and everything else we lift up before you as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please stand. Receive now the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you, be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you a favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We go in song.